Hi, I'm Shan Wu with a Undercolor of Law hot take on this reporting from the New York Times, which gave a real inside look at just what Chief Justice Roberts has been doing to influence the Supreme Court. This is a stunning break of tradition in the Times that got this scoop. The Supreme Court is really usually buttoned down. Obviously, we've seen cracks in that, like the leaked opinion in Dobbs. But we'll talk about this later. But the fact that there is this kind of information coming out, and according to the reporting, it's from both liberals and conservative sources, it really says something about what's happening at that institution. So what we learn from this reporting? A lot of commentators, including me, have been critical of Roberts for not exercising more authority upon the court. I mean, he is the chief justice. He's a self-proclaimed institutionalist. And so with the court sinking to historic lows in public confidence and reputation due to scandals like Justice Clarence Thomas's wife being on the side of the election deniers, his enormous amounts of undisclosed gifts, Justice Alito's wife, according to Justice Alito, <laughs> running up an extremist flag and Alito himself not disclosing other sorts of friends with benefits, aspects of his relationships to very rich people, all those things have led to this historic low in the Supreme Court's esteem. And what has Roberts done about it? Well, both critics and defenders have said, you know, his tools are kind of limited here. I mean, he basically has the power to assign cases. We've asked, why doesn't he try to force somebody like Alito or Thomas to recuse themselves, to discipline them? But in fairness, it's unclear what he can really do with those limited tools. Well, what's really revealing about this article is we see what he can do with those limited tools. And it's now clear that Roberts is a chief justice who is fully aware of how he can wield his power and the pro-Trump ways in which he has wielded that power. So the reporting focuses on three particular actions of Roberts. In all three instances, he gave himself the power of authorship. That's kind of like the main function of the chief justice. He gets to assign opinions. So the first one was the presidential immunity opinion, very important one, which we'll talk about in a second. Then there was an unsigned opinion, which was about whether Trump could be barred from the election ballot in Colorado. And the third one was an opinion he did, but originally the opinion was assigned to Justice Alito, but Roberts took it on for himself. That was the one about whether certain obstruction charges could continue against some of the Capitol rioters. So let's start with the unsigned opinion. Uh, that's the one in which the court unanimously said that Trump could not be kept off the ballot uh, in Colorado. <clears throat> Under the 14th Amendment argument that barred him insurrectionists <laughs> from holding office. So an unsigned opinion is meant to make the court speak with one voice in like an anonymous way. And when it's 9-0 that way, it's unanimous and it's anonymous, it's meant to give the impression that the court stands so strongly behind this that they speak with one voice. Now, in this instance, it sounds like well, we know <laughs> all the justices, unfortunately, liberal and conservative, really wanted to weigh in on this. And I fault them. I have great respect um, for the liberal justices, but I fault them because of where they are seems to have influenced the way they think, which is they did not have to step in on this. But our whole system of making people judges and then justices all relies upon this idea that they are the final arbiters of the Constitution, but that's morphed into they're the final arbiters of really important things. <laughs> and that's how they viewed this question of the ballot issue. They weren't willing to let states do their job and decide who can be on their ballots. They had to weigh in on that. So the interesting thing about this was that Roberts behind the scenes apparently really strong-armed his colleagues into wanting to sign on to this opinion so they could have it unsigned and have it unanimous. But of course, what he ended up with was a very weird um, unsigned unanimous 
opinion in which there were basically other opinions. They weren't the sense. They agreed with the outcome, which is Trump can't be barred. But there's a lot of dissent, really, in terms of other opinions that were written talking about whether they're going too far or not going too far. So it's an example of him trying very hard to make sure that the court looks united, and he uses his power to do that, which is he strong arms the people, according to reporting, to sign on to this. But you still see the cracks, because it's not really the court speaking in one voice. But what's the outcome? Obviously, very helpful <clears throat> to Trump, because had they allowed this to go forward, letting states decide if he can be barred, because he is arguably an insurrectionist, then what you would have is a disaster, right, for the Trump campaign. Can you imagine? I mean, he gets off, thrown off the ballots in a couple of liberal states. That's the end of the campaign right there. So that was the unsigned opinion. Next, we come to the question of the obstruction charge, um, which now they have ruled can't be used in certain instances. The heart of that was the question of an obstruction of justice charge that arose from way back in the Enron accounting scandal. And it was about destroying documents, really, old-fashioned way, shred them. <laughs> and there's a question of whether that shredding, which was meant to obstruct that proceeding, the investigation, prosecutions, whether that type of obstruction also would apply to the Capitol rioters who were trying to obstruct the official proceeding of counting for the Electoral College. So that case was, again, something which Roberts took on. But interestingly enough, Alito was originally the one assigned to write the opinion. Now, it's very rare that an opinion gets switched unless the outcome switched. So let's say Alito's going to write the majority opinion, <clears throat> but then the votes changed and he becomes a dissenter. That's when the authorship would change. But very unusual for it to change when the outcome's basically the same. Now, a slight side note here, many of you may already know this, but when the Supreme Court or any appellate court takes these cases on, it's not really like a jury. They hear the case for the first time. Now they're going to start to work on it, research, think about it. They've kind of already come to it, not kind of. They've come to it with their minds made up. The moment those oral arguments end, they have a conference. The opinion writer gets assigned. They really take the vote there. You pretty much know already. And they've come to that post-argument conference already knowing which way they're going to vote. So this idea of them approaching it with a clean slate, open mind, that's kind of nonsense. I mean, they're doing their own research. They approach it with their own version of a clean slate. But it's not like, oh, we've heard the arguments for the first time. Now we're going to start thinking about it. They have done that long ago. So... In this instance, the timing was what's really interesting because right around the time that the opinion switched over to Roberts writing it <clears throat> instead of Alito, same outcome, kind of pro-Trump, knocked out some of those obstruction charges. That was when Alito was taking a lot of heat over this question of the flag flying issues. And so it would seem like what Roberts was doing there was he wanted to give some window dressing for another pro-Trump decision not to be coming from Alito in the midst of looking like, you know, a guy who flies the flag literally uh, for the extreme right. And he wants to alter that to have him write it to sort of shelter the court from further criticism. You know what really would have sheltered the court from further criticism is if he somehow forced Alito to recuse himself from it and Thomas. <clears throat> that would be a decision of integrity, not manipulation. But <clears throat> as we're seeing, that's not Chief Justice Roberts. So that brings us to the presidential immunity <clears throat> case, which is probably the most significant. Right from the be beginning, he wanted to take that opinion. He had circulated a confidential memo previously in which he really criticized the DC Circuit's opinion. He really didn't like it at all. And What's really critical here is, as the New York Times pointed out, both Roberts and Kavanaugh had served as White House counsel. Now, that's a position in which the lawyers are trying to protect the power of the executive. But, you know, I don't really buy that as the main reason why Roberts and the conservatives went down this route. Because, to me, 
Anybody who thinks with real integrity, intelligence, and independence understands that the real way you protect an institution's integrity and respect is by making sure that it's a fair institution, that the rules, particularly if in courts, apply equally, and that, that there is a bad actor which would undermine the institution, the country, democracy, or abuse their power, that you make sure the institution can hold that bad actor accountable. So the fact that he ends up protecting Trump, who is arguably, allegedly, maybe the worst bad actor in the history of the presidency, indicates it's really less about protecting the institution and more about protecting the power of the man leading their party. Sure, he can dress it up a lot with a lot of rhetoric, as can the other conservative justices. As Gorsuch put it, you know, the writing for the ages, uh, or the criticism that the lower court has somehow been short-sighted, or there need to be more elaborate legal standards. Well, the legal standard they came up with is pretty pathetic, actually. I mean, it's extremely convoluted. Most legal experts think it's very hard to apply what they were trying to do about immunity. And now it's basically been kicked back to Judge Chutkin to sort of figure all that stuff out. And of course, the real triumph for Trump is the enormous delay in the case. But they didn't have to do that. They couldn't let the D.C. Circuit stand, but they had to turn it into this big convoluted constitutional issue where none had previously existed, right? There'd never been any other finding of immunity <laughs> for presidents. And there's good reason for that because none exists. They just came up with this out of whole cloth. I think there's a quote from Roberts, <clears throat> I think during the oral argument, that really cuts to the heart of it, where he's criticizing the lower court's rationale by saying that the lower court seems to think that a former president can be prosecuted because he was being prosecuted, meaning he thinks that's circular reasoning instead of doing good constitutional analysis. But you know, that's one thing Roberts kind of got right. That is what the lower court said. They said, if a former president's being prosecuted, then he can be prosecuted. Because why? The same protections, the same safeguards that apply for anybody else being prosecuted apply here. It's got to go through an investigation. There's got to be probable cause. There's got to be a grand jury. There's got to be a judge. There's defense lawyers. There's all these things that apply to protect that defendant who happens to be a former president. But that wasn't good enough for Roberts and the other conservatives. They had to come up with a special rule. And you know that there's a problem that they're trying to save the head of their party because in the whole history of our country, he's the only president that's ever been criminally charged. And there's a reason you don't pick up that many criminal charges. It's never happened before. State prosecutors, as well as federal prosecutions going on here. But Roberts wanted to hide all that behind window dressing that he wanted to author, and he did a really poor job, it's a really poorly written opinion, but he wanted to cover up this really significant case, like he wanted to cover up the real machinations behind the scenes in which he was wielding his power to help Donald Trump. That's it for now. The full reporting on that story is in the New York Times. And of course, it's behind the paywall. And those of you who follow me on Twitter, and I hope you all will, follow me at, at shanonwu. It's not dot com, at shanonwu. Um, you'll see I often will give the articles as gifts so that people can read them without the paywall there. And I'll be doing that in this instance. Once this video comes out, I'll promote it on Twitter or X and we'll include the article as a gift version. Um, so I hope that you will watch it. I hope that you'll follow me on Twitter and I hope that you'll comment um, because it's a great way to have some dialogue going on about these important issues. And I love to hear your replies and comments about these videos so that we know what else we should talk about. All right, talk to you soon. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com newsletter.